the big idea here is that we already know about self-organization and self-organizing teams in Agile, but then we still haven't gotten to the place of self-governing teams, like how decisions are made, how power is shared. So, and that's what, you know, if you are familiar with uh, Frederick Laloux's model of organizations, TEAL, so this is one of those ways you can make your organization or your teams TEAL. So this is very practical, very useful. And um, just, just by way of introduction, you know, I'm a business agility coach um, available on the interwebs. And my connection with sociocracy is that I'm a trained practitioner and facilitator and um, currently a working member of sociocracy for all in their open source group. So I'm tied into where they're actually practicing and living it. And I try to bring as much as possible in the, in the agile world that I'm engaged with. So first question comes in, well, why governance? What's the larger context? So decision-making is happening all the time around us. But, you know, typically, so in, in, a, in a company, the boss decides, you know, we say, well, the big boss has decided. In the house, you'll say, well, the mom has, mom decided. Or in some cases, we'll say majority vote wins. And in that majority vote, there are winners and there's losers, right? But there's many mechanisms. So if you think about not just how Scrum is done well or Kanban is done well, but what about other elements of decision-making? So governance does matter because that's about sharing power versus power over. And more and more, we have a diverse group of people in our workforce. We have up to five generations in the workforce from the baby movers to Gen Z. And I don't even know what the latest generation is called, but there they have all gravitated towards different needs, different desires, different hopes and aspirations. And we actually surpassed, we've gone past what used to be called knowledge work. You know, knowledge work was a term that Peter Drucker came up with, but since we've surpassed it and, you know, it's, it has permeated all facets of our society, manufacturing, you know, talk about Tesla, SpaceX, you know, Amazon, software as a services. These are all basically brand new companies that are not necessarily traditional. Even if they're traditional, software is eating them all up. So it's more important to understand how we decide how we keep it practical and how do we include people and we move in a positive direction. So a lot of time people have this weird uh, idea that if we're getting things done, we can really emphasize getting things done, get out of the way and get things done. And you can either get things done or you can listen and hold space and connect and socialize. So people have this belief that, you know, you're gonna have one way or the other way, you're not have the wrong way. And in many ways, this is a false dichotomy because really you could have fun at work. And you know, it is true, workplaces are in some cases making people sick, but there's also workplaces that are still fun. And there's elements and patterns that you look at and observe and start to shift them. So what we say is introducing certain structures and protocols, you can actually achieve this sense of purpose and fun, getting things done, while still including people. And that sense of community, that, that, that integration is very, very important. And it's regardless of what framework model methodology you're using. So coming back to the term sociocracy, it comes from the phrase socio and kratos, which means people who associate together, decide together, or more colloquially decisions by those that associate together. And that's an important aspect. So think of a team that is a natural working team that has work to work together and there's, there's need for them to be together. They are associated themselves. If you talk about a community of practice, an intentional community, permaculture or an organization, all those are ways of association and you can have better ways of governance and decision-making. So what sociocracy really boils down to is three pillars. One is decision-making by consent. Now that's an important, so if, if nothing else, as we go through these, some of these exercises, it's important to know why consent is more important than consensus or more powerful than consensus. So one of the pillars of sociocracy is that we make decisions by consent and more coming in a few slides that I will talk about that. 
Second pillar is organizational structure by linked circles. There is this idea of how we form circles and we create double linkage. So there are members of these circles that are intertwined that are linked by the same. So two people will be part of the of two different circles. And that's the way that information is flowing with them. Again, more on that later. And then the third pillar is continuous evolution by feedback. We don't assume that we already have the answers and we're going to do Bible bashing and we're going to tell everybody this is how things are done. We're going to start in a structure that has the right guardrails and continues to evolve. So what this gives us is a fine balance between effectiveness and egalitarian where the voice of the people are included. And at the end of the day, we could all have a friendly chat. We could really have a good time together, but we may not go anywhere. So power difference, understanding there are supposed to be power differences is important. Because when you share power, like power is neither evil or bad, but when you share power, then you know you're going somewhere. So if there's a leader of a circle, there is an aim, there's a purpose, there's a domain. It's not about just holding hand, but it's also moving in the right path. And that's where, well, where are we driving towards? What is the aim? What is the, what is the charter? What is the purpose of this team or the organization? And we know these goals and aims are extremely important. So we do roles, roles by consent. We, the rules are selected by consent, meetings are rent by consent, and then performance reviews are held in a, the, probably the best way possible. I've been in corporate America for a long time and the nine boxes, and, you know, consistent superior performance and inconsistent, all those things always rubbed me the wrong way. Until I became part of the sofa fabric, I was always freaked out about performance reviews until I saw them run in a very different way. It was like a light bulb going off because it was more about, hey, let's go in rounds and talk about the ways you've done a great job. And in a way, also go in rounds and talk about the ways you wanna learn more. And it is such a humane and wonderful way. And I, you know, I kind of by, by default always go into those protocols. And then finally, interpersonal feedback, you know, we know as Agilist, I think I'll be preaching to the choir, the value of shorter feedback loops is essential in growing and improving any structure that you propose. Writing proposal together, creating workflow. So those are more details. So let's take a step back, journey through time. Well, where did it start and who uses it? So it was started by this gentleman in the Netherlands named Gerard Endenberg. And he was the owner of an electrical company. And he introduced this idea of sharing power with his own employees. And that's where the, the root of sociocracy came. And then other people have taken it on to the next level. It has been applied in many places. So it's not even new. It's already like 40 years old. And schools have adopted it, like this group called Wandering Circles where the schools are being run in a socioc sociocratic way. Actually, there's a book that was released recently by SOFA too, which, which, which codifies how that's done. There's also eco-villages, intentional communities, and uh, permaculture that are doing this. And we know, so one of the core things you'll hear, and we'll probably, I'm, I'm hoping that we can get to practice this, the simple act of doing rounds. It's, it's, it's just so magical. And you know, you may be saying like, well, what, what does that mean? So we'll, we'll probably, we'll, we'll do a test round, but I just wanted to at least see that these things are very, very critical. And then the famous one in Agile, Spotify. You know, some people argue this is not a model and they're correct because Spotify doesn't call it a model. But if you look at the origins of Spotify, they totally took the playbook or the ideas from sociocracy and created domains and tribes and squads and potluck. They were very intentional about applying sociocracy in Spotify. And then we talk about autonomy with alignment, but that was one of the biggest experiments that happened in trying to do company-wide agility. And this is the circle I belong to, uh, where I'm a working member of sociocracy in free and open source software projects. And we're continuing to engage with software communities that are adopting this as a governance model because they're already building software. They're already building software that way. It's just that decision-making is not happening that way. And this 
that becomes a strange fit. And then we're moving in that direction where it is becoming more and more valuable. So this is an interesting chart of if you want to go even further back. But if you see if Gerard Enderberg comes in the 70s, brings in cybernetics and dynamic governance, Agile comes in around 2000s, and then holacracy, sociocracy, they kind of have the same origins. Holoc holacracy got popularized by Zappos, but their fundamentals are the same. So, all right. So I'm going to stop here and shift gears into one of the things about, con because we talked about consent being most important. So what is consent? So let's talk about typical decision-making that may not surprise you at all. A proposal is made at the highest levels and the hierarchy has made the decision it flows down. And other people may disagree with it, but that's, that's not what's gonna get implemented. They have no right to say that because it came from the CEO. It came from the CFO, it came from the board of governors, and you cannot say no. And that's that's the typical top-down that we're familiar with. And then there's another method which we where we vote. Like some people vote, some people don't vote. So, or in some cases, we say, like, you know, uh, consensus minus 10 or consensus minus one, right? We suppress that one person and then we say, yeah, we have a majority vote. And in that case, there are winners, then there's losers. Now, consent is a little different. The proposal is made in a circle of people who are associating or working together, and either they all agree and there's a decision made, or somebody disagrees. Now, that objection is very important. It's very valuable. Existing as objections actually drives us forward. Now, we need to understand whether that objection is a real objection or just some issue of preference. So if there's an objection, it's not an agreement. We need to integrate that objection. So that's the critical part, because if there's a there's the objection, we need to integrate it and then modify the proposal. But it's also not saying like it's consensus, like everybody needs to agree, because we need to find out whether there's a preference there or not. So I like this visual in explaining. We as human beings all have a preference. And you talk to uh, software engineers, they kind of like, they talk about frameworks as if they're like really, really married into it. Like they'll say, well, this framework versus this framework. And they'll keep on arguing and arguing. It's like arguing about ice cream, vanilla versus chocolate. You know, I love vanilla ice cream and everybody who likes chocolate is a fool. And, or I like chocolate ice cream, anybody who likes vanilla is a fool, right? So then the software engineers kind of have these strange arguments. But if it's a hot day, I may have any ice cream. Right? But my preference would be a certain type of flavor. So that's your preference. But then if it's a really hot day, you know, and I'm sweating, any ice cream will do, that's kind of a space of tolerance, right? I will tolerate it. Ice cream is ice cream. And that's important to know. And there's genuine objections, right? I may not have ice cream, but I will put a coal in my mouth and say, hey, wait, putting a coal, a burning coal in your mouth or even not burnt cold is like harmful to your health. That's not good for you. So there's an objection there and we want to remove harm. So that's the objection. And this space between what's your preference and what you will tolerate is called consent. Just to reiterate, perfect for me, my preference. This works and sociocracy teaches us that this works for all of us. And so when we're integrating objections, we're working with more instead of the narrow of personal preferences. But if there's harm, we want to remove the harm. So the idea here is to always think of the aim. Well, what is the aim of this group or this team or this organization? Does this proposal help us reach our aim? It's not just about personal preference. Or does it negatively impact how we reach our aim? So I consent, meaning I have no objections, or I don't consent and I have an objection. Right? Does that, does that somewhat make sense in, in just framing of it? So I want to share a metaphor, and this was such a gift to me. I don't, I don't do any sailing, but some of my friends do. And they explain that people imagine that a sailboat just goes straight. And that is completely incorrect picture. If you look at it, they're basically going a little bit zigzag. 
and that's called tacking. So that objections, if you look at wind as objections, the tacking is allowing you to pivot and move in the destination you need to go. So that's a wonderful metaphor for objections actually drive us forward, but we have to navigate them instead of saying, no, 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 this doesn't even exist. We're gonna go in a straight line, but that's not how human systems work. So what if you don't consent? A proposal was made and some aspect of it is not good. Well, we need to understand what is the objection. And you have to state your objection in the circle together, trying to find how to integrate that objection. And the strategies are either amend the proposal, make the length shorter. So instead of saying, hey, we're gonna run a certain protocol for a year, we say, well, what if we try it for six weeks? right, and learn from the experiment. That may reduce this thing. So, okay, we can try it for six weeks, but not for a whole year. Or track the concern. All right, we, underst we, we understand your risk. We don't know if it's factual or not, but we understand that. But let's track it, whether that manifests or not. And that's way how we will amend or modify the proposal to make sure that everybody consents to it. So let's take a pause. We, we're going to try to practice a little bit. What, what, what are your questions here? I, so one, one might argue that this, um, so, so can, yeah, so that the idea is to have reach, uh, uh, you know, the consent and separate preference from, um, you know, my preference from um, what works or, and, and, and so the, it it sounds like it needs to be somewhat facilitated, or at least that conversation yes. needs to be, uh, you know, happening, you know, um, you know, by someone who's neutral, uh, or 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 have the sort of the skills to navigate the the different objections and put them, you know, on uh, on the table. And how how is skill acquired? Usually, yeah, practice. Yeah, so practice, they, right? Yeah, so they would. So the group may practice. I, I, I guess navigates through the objections on their own, or, or they may need some, you know, facility or help from sure. someone who has some experience to get them, you know, or to start at least get that, you know. Um, yeah, absolutely. And we haven't gotten to the roles yet, but there, there is aspects of these things. It's just like, it's a great idea. And, you know, I've been working with sociocracy for all for a couple of years now, and that's how we live our lives. So it, for us, it's like it's complete makes sense. But from an outside, I said, well, how are you making it happen? Because there's roles, there's facilitator, what are the structures? And we haven't gotten that far. We only talked about consent in an abstract, but then until you start to practice, and yes, skill is important. And there are some differences as well, but I would say absolutely there it 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 needs to be. I, I would I would just modify a little bit, not an outsider, but somebody from within who is skilled, and then the group itself is getting smarter over time too. But there is definitely a facilitator role that's needed to do this. When you're talking about um, consent, are you already have you already framed a specific problem? That is an important aspect of it. So we have to frame a specific problem. Yes. And it it's specificity. So with, with command and control systems, you don't need a lot of structure. But with structures like these that are inclusive, holistic, you need a lot more structure. So just like saying, you know, if you've ever been to an open space or a lean coffee, people might say, yeah, let them just have it. But you'll find that there's protocols, there's an opening circle, there's a closing circle, there's mark. There's the marketplace, there's the rules and there's laws. And all those things are structures that help us can like create the structure, create a, a rhythm to it. So, so yes, absolutely. You know, there's, there's, um, and I don't know if I'm, I, there was another question behind that question, but, but that's, maybe you can ask me again if there's, if that's clarifying or not. Well, the thing I've, thinking about is that usually the objections I've seen are not that they don't like this particular solution to the problem. It's that they think you're working on the wrong problem. And it may be something where it's not that that's not a pressing problem. They just think their problem is more important than 
whatever the yes. problem is that's being addressed. So I, I would say that's real. And so maybe we are, we are going into an actual practice round where we can see how this works. But eventually everybody can voice their opinion. And a lot of, some people are quiet. Some people are shelters. Some people are loud mouth. Their agenda is kind of driving. So how do we share that space where everybody gets an opportunity to go in rounds and provide the input? But framing is important. We don't want to go loose and everywhere. Well, what do you guys think? We have to specify, well, what is, what is the boundary of this proposal? What is the structure? And then go in rounds. So maybe we're already going into that. So it probably is useful to go into the process and maybe do a practice round. How does that sound? That's fine. Yep. So we have to first understand the proposal. It cannot be just loosey-goosey. Like, what is the proposal? And then we do rounds of clarifying questions. Well, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? And then once we do that, we explore our reactions. What, what, how, what are your reactions? What do you like about it? What do you don't like about it? And then we do the decision, that's the consent route. So we are gonna do a mock mock situation here. Um, and this is this is in case of, you know, there's an objection, how do you understand a reaction? But I think instead of doing, doing a uh, more theory, let's try to practice. So here's a proposal. So imagine we are partners running a cafe, or we have some of us play a different operational role in running that cafe, but there's, there's a desire to work together. We are in that business and we are running a cafe with healthy breakfast, snacks, and hot drinks. The, and our circle is infrastructure and maintenance circle. So we are responsible for taking care of seating, materials, supplies, and so providing and maintaining the built environment of the cafe, that was our charge. That was our mandate. So the three or the four of us, including me, have that mandate of the infrastructure and maintenance for that restaurant. So the proposal here is to increase the number of tables from 20 to 24 and the number of chairs from 40 to 48. So I'm gonna stop sharing uh, or I'm gonna stop um, presenting so that I can make modifications. But here's what I'm gonna do. I am going to, as the facilitator here, I'm going to insert myself into that and we're gonna do rounds. So, so there's a little bit of role play going on. So imagine we are all peers and we are in the restaurant business taking care of the infrastructure and uh, maintenance. So you can come up with some role play ideas, whatever you like everything is open, but the context is the restaurant. So I am gonna create a, um, a round or a circle. So I'm gonna say it's gonna be Sheila, then Salah, then me, and then Naga. So what I just did was I created a sequence. If you look at the chat, I created a sequence. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna understand the proposal first. So let's hear from Sheila, then Salah. Sheila, what questions do you have about the proposal? Is there physically space to add those tables or will we be violating any zoning laws, any fire uh, laws? You know that you have to have a certain amount of space around everything. And I honestly don't know if we have enough space. Yeah. That would be my biggest concern. So, and, and I, I, because I was the one who brought the proposal, I may have some information. So we had checked with the fire marshal. We have a capacity of 50 people in that restaurant at max, but it is the way it's laid out. It can feel snug, but we, we are at code by the fire but marshal. When yeah. you say you're at code for 50 people, that's fine, but that's not what I'm asking. What I'm saying is that you have to have fire lanes that have to be a certain distance Absolutely. from the wall and a certain amount of space between the tables. And I'm not sure how we would configure them to fit additional tables in. My next objection is, can we still get the same type of table? So, so that it won't look odd. So I think let's, let's hold off on you know, objections at the moment. We're just trying to understand the proposal. So what I heard from you was knowing that we're all in the same restaurant, but there, there may be, you know, understand we're adding more tables, but the question would be, well, why are we doing that, right? Or what's the what's the proposal? And then we'll talk about, I think you have a great point about fire lanes. And I mean, 
we, we're trying to accommodate more customers, but yeah, you, you may be right there, 100%. So I think if, if that's, that's your question, let's come back to that in our objection round to see what we can do about it. But if there's no other question, then maybe, you know, Sheila, did you complete or was there any other questions, clarifying questions about the proposal? I mean, from the, from the perspective of, of profitability, if we're paying for the same space and we can serve more people and we have enough traffic now that we would be getting more traffic if we had the space for them, it makes perfect sense. There's a great return on investment. Hundred percent. So, so I think what you're also adding is why it's like it makes business sense. So let's let's go in rounds. Let's hear from everybody. And was there anything else, Sheila, you wanted to ask, or should we continue? So Salah, then then me. Salah, what what clarifying questions you have on the proposal? Um, yeah, I think I mean along the same uh, same lines. Um, you know what what's the goal of increasing the number? Is it is it more of Income, more more revenue, uh, more uh, patrons to visit, or or you know more traffic. Yes. So lately, we've been since the pandemic, our restaurant business has just blown up. As since as we've opened up again, our our doors to other people, we found that people are waiting in line outside just to be seated, and it's just the line keeps on growing and growing. And so for us to run the business, we, we need to think about how we can accommodate more people in the restaurant. So I think there was an, a factor of COVID that exploded our business and we are no longer able to maintain, sustain the capacity. So we need to think about how do we accommodate more customers? Any other questions, Salah, for clarification? Uh, no, I'm good. Right. So myself, then Naga. So I, I have, I do have a clarifying question because also I received this from the headquarters where obviously the infrastructure. So I don't know where the numbers came from, but I can understand the, there's, the numbers are increasing relatively modestly, 20 to 24 and 40 to 48, but I don't know if they've actually visited the site. So I can hold that concern, but I don't have any, I can see why the proposal exists. So I'll pass. And then Naga? Uh, more or less, I do have the similar uh, um, objection or to give the consent. Do we really have so much business there? And do we really see an opportunity to grow? Maybe it is really required. Maybe can't we, uh, can't we accommodate them uh, faster with more people? rather increasing our capacity on the infra. Maybe yeah. we increase our capacity of serving people. So as Quick. being on the site, yes. So that's a, that's a very good question. So on the site, we know that we used to have five people waiting outside the restaurant to be seated as soon as people are finished with their meal, we can't rush people to finish their meal. But now that people were used to be five, now it's 25 people waiting outside the restaurant. So we know there is demand on our side and we're in the business so we can see that data. So definitely there, we are being crushed by the demand. But now the question is how much is a good question to ask, right? Any other questions, Naga? No, I'm good there. Thank you. So maybe let's do another round. Sheila, what other clarifying questions do you have? And if you don't, you can say pass. Okay. Um, I do have still the question about if we go forward with this, would we be using the same type of seating, the same tables? And do we know if they're available? Because of the pandemic, a lot of things that used to be easy to get a hold of are not. Have we thought about, you know, because we would have to replace the existing ones too. Have we yeah. thought about uh, thought about the furniture? Well, that would be a question is, would we have to replace the existing ones or can we reconfigure yeah. and make space to just add additional that are either the same or complementary to the ones that we already have? Yeah, that's a, that's a great, great point. And we, we have to, we have to find that out, right? Because that's our job to go and make that purchase. And if the supply chain is shot, we can't really say, just add four more completely mismatched chairs or two like or mismatched tables to the existing ones. So that's, no. that's a great question. But I, I, do, I do know with not 
Naga's question about adding servers, how fast are people getting served? Are they waiting? I mean, even if part of it's self-service, if they're having to wait for refills or you know, plates aren't being brought out quickly enough or whatever, you still need to check and see, do we really, is, is it really that we need more tables or is it really that we need more staff? Yeah, so we have to we have question. to have so because this is a play scenario, in 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 real life we will actually know those numbers. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make them up right now. We yeah. are currently compared to other restaurants very well staffed. We have five servers at staff for five servers. The real limitation is not how many servers we have because our our staff is very loyal. The question is what the line that's outside the door. So we are actually serving them well, but there's. There is literally no seat available, and when people call us earlier for reservations, they have to, they, you know, they have to wait, like be given three hour time frames, and people, customers are not very happy about that. So, so again, we'll be, depending on the scenario, we may or may not have that opinion. In this particular case, I'm sharing uh, made up data so that we can sure. continue to proceed. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, Shell, any other reactions or any other? Right? Salah, what about you? Salah, then me. Yeah, um, I, I guess my question is more like, uh, do we have any data on, um, you know, how how long on average does it take someone to get in and out, or like, yeah. do we have like a, sort of like the analysis of, um, about like how many people come to pick up their orders and leave, and how many people just uh, uh, come and dine in. Um, yeah. Or are we is this just a rough numbers that no, we... we do have that data? I think it's based on the software that we're using when we hold a seat for somebody and take that order to the time people leave and they pay their check. And we've been tracking that's about 35 minutes. 35 minutes on average. Some people leave early, some people with families tend to stay longer. So it, it varies, but on average we have 35 minutes. And the queue tends to tends to sustain itself from 25 to 30 people, but it fluctuates. And weekends is weekends are more problematic than weekdays, so we have that data. Yes. So the so the wait time in line is roughly thirty five minutes or 30. thirty five minutes for somebody to finish their meal, and then you know that see that table becomes available. We are we, our staff is very good at cleaning up a table, getting it ready for the next group within a couple of minutes, and they're they're pretty quick. At the moment somebody leaves, then we can bring another group in saying, hey, table has just become available. Okay. But what, so what's the wait average or like the waiting for people who are standing in line? So uh, for the person who's first in queue would actually have to wait 35 minutes 35. at worst case scenario, right? Until somebody leaves, but there are multiple tables becoming available. So there's, there's a little bit of a dynamical system, not necessarily a very, very static system. So, so the what's the assumption we're making here is that, is that that if we increase well, the capacity of the room of the cafe, then we reduce the wait time. Is that so? Uh, I'm going to now invite you to make those assumptions because you're also part of the staff who has sites yeah. on it. So, what assumptions would you, knowing that you're part of the business, what do you see? Uh, well, that would be my assumption: is that if we increase the the capacity of the of the you know the number of tables, number of chairs, then you know we could um, reduce the wait time and increase our um, daily revenue. Yeah. So it it and so yes, and I'll go with the yes and part of it, right? Because it it is still a made up scenario. And we can, we can, the objective is to reduce the wait time in this particular case. Did, was that, did you get a chance to? Did yeah, that these are all the questions I have, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Salah. Myself, I don't have any more questions. Naga? Yeah, I do have. Uh, so just to go with that, so do we have any uh, data with us that, uh, there is there are a lot of people waiting in the afternoon or in the evening. Do we have anything speculating on that? Yeah. So afternoon. Maybe as you make it. Yeah. So I'm why sorry. don't you make make something up here? What do you yeah. think? Assuming if it is in the evening or maybe towards night, maybe uh, 
uh, as as a as a business responsible person maybe i would probably think of an option why can't we uh, look for an alternative why can't we make our cave uh, installed with a live music instead having a new infrastructure being placed yeah well so the first thing is because we are the infrastructure group it's our it's our job to make sure and we are a, we are a you know five star restaurant so we have to uphold our standards and our you know people come for fine dining in our restaurant so but that's kind of our job yes there's the the group that is live entertainment that's a different group that's sending it but our circle is our domain our circle works on infrastructure that's kind of when things break furniture breaks we have enough um, supply in stock that we can replace them or we can repair them all right so maybe uh, assuming that fact instead if i would want to replace all of these tables and all of these chairs as an in infrastructure guy i incur a lot of cost to the organization if i come up with an initiative like this maybe i can reduce on the infrastructural cost maybe i can go with half of it sure and so, maybe i can give a better experience so let's let's talk about now so we're moving into a, uh, so reactions and objections so maybe we should amend our proposal right so that's what i'm i'm hearing from so let's let's have a quick reactions that this proposal let's let's go do a round of objections and we could explain your objection and why and then we can we can go and see what we can do about the integrations so let's go back to the same sequence sheila then sara what objections now this is when we do the objections what objection do you have and why um have we explored we haven't explored alternatives to expanding the seating in that space um, and i think we should so for so instance for instance i'm not sure if we have any seating capacity outside of that room that's that's we do have some seating capacity outside so we so why don't you come up with some assumption here because again this is a play scenario so it will be our job as the domain as a circle who's responsible for infrastructure to make that study or observation so what do you think is is uh, the assumption that you want to make here my assumption is that if we make it too crowded we're going to not reduce the wait times if we start to use the outside space that's available we wouldn't have to match the furniture okay. and we can probably make it usable either all year round or most of the year and there are people that still prefer to sit outside so i think we need to explore that as an alternative and we might even be able to gain more than just the the number of tables that we're talking about right now yep so so what i'm hearing from you is that the inspired space will not give us the benefit of reducing wait time and we might be better off using the outside space yeah i think we need to look at that assumption that, that that it would reduce wait time because i'm not sure it would depending on how we can configure things that would be my biggest concern sure. other than supply chain yeah i i totally agree so as your objection again if i captured did i capture it correctly that this there may be something wrong in assuming that that's the way to go but if we were to utilize the outside space it should not be a problem okay any other objections that you have yeah Okay, let's go with Salad and myself. What objections do you have to the proposal as it stands? Um, well, a couple of um, objections or, or ideas. Like one, this, you know, having to, increasing the capacity or the table may, may crowd the space so people won't have enough, you know, space to, uh, to move around. Um, and, and it could may, make the experience a little, you know, um, you know, more unpleasant. Uh, yep. so, th so that's one um, objection. And then the other is, uh, so let's say if, if we add more, more chairs or more tables, and then that means we have more, um, you know, um, orders to fulfill, then we may need more to hire more servers, or maybe the servers themselves will be overloaded if we don't hire anybody. To, to help. Okay. All right. 
And that may not be a bad thing as a growing business, but I heard two objections. One is increasing table and seats may make place the crop more crowded, unpleasant, or even hazardous. And we will need to hire more servers if we want to provide like a responsive service. And I don't have any objections further, uh, but I do agree with what Sheila is saying and what you're saying. So I I also am leaning towards looking at it differently. What about you, Naga? What objections do you have? I'm all good with it. Okay. As as uh, Sela was saying, the ambience goes at a toss. Maybe yes. if we are we are trying to put a lot of tables and chairs. So ambience and experience might be compromised, right? So here's, I'm gonna propose a modification to the proposal. So I am going to say this one is, I will cross it out. So increase the number of tables from 20 to 24 and the number of chairs from 40 to 48 with all new chairs and tables set up outside in our unused patio space. And let's make plans, let's recommend to our paper parent circle to hire more one more server. Do you see what I just did? I just modified the proposal. So now let's go back in the rounds and see what your reactions are. Is your objection resolved or is does it still stand? So Sheila, then Salah. Uh, based on the new um, proposal, I would have a concern that we have some way to heat the space and to cover it in case of rain. So we need to look into not just tables for outside, but we need to look into um, a canopy, yes. some kind of, you know, there'd be other materials, so, but that would be my only objection. So now that's going into another advanced scenario. So let's assume there's already a canopy or covered space and that we live in a mild climate around say uh, Atlanta, for example, right? So we it's hot, but it doesn't require heating. So let's, again, so otherwise we'll, because it's an imagined scenario, we're working with data that is like, you know, just imagined. Okay. So it may go into infinite yeah. loop. Yeah. That's fine. Salah, then myself. So are we are we um, doing objections for this round or questioning? No, so, the, the new so is your objection integrated with this new proposal? Uh, yes. Yeah, one, one more server. Okay, yeah. Myself, I, I I believe my objections have been also addressed in that. What about Naga? Yes, Evan. All, All right. of them are included. So now at this point, I will ask people to consent. If you consent, you do a thumbs up. Or if you don't consent, then you do a thumbs down. So do you all consent? Would you tolerate this new proposal? So I see one thumbs up, Salah, Naga. All right. So we have a consent and then we move on, right? And again, because the frame, this is an imagination scenario, situation, right? You have to work with real problems. You have to work with real problems and you have to have control over it, right? It's not like we're gonna solve problems for others, but it's us ourselves. So that is kind of like the demo. And obviously I invite you to do it more and more. I may, and I know we're running out of time, but hopefully that kind of clarified some of the abstractness of why we do things a certain way. So going back to the slide deck, if you can, you guys can still see my full, uh, my slides, right? So we are, the first round, when we go in rounds, is to understand the proposal, ask clarifying, well, what exactly is this proposal about? Not necessarily objections, what is it about? Quick reactions, I don't like it, or here's what's going on. Then if there's objections, we do decision. And if there's an objection, we understand the objection. And the objection really needs to be whether it's harmful for our why our purpose or not harmful. And then amend the ideas and then create a new proposal and then go through a round and do a consent. So that's the general idea. And then we do have an iterative round. So with that being said, obviously 
a simple decision-making protocol is not enough. We need to have structure and roles. So, and we're kind of running out of time, but tell me a few things about uh, this wave. So imagine we have an organization of 25 people and say, let's say there's Salah here, right? Salah, uh, Sheila, and uh, myself, so, and Naga, and then many of other of our colleagues in a working group. What's good about this circle and what's bad about this particular circle? Just shout out some answers in the interest of time. All of them are uniform. All of them uniform. But how long will it take for us to make a decision if this is that many people? So, yeah. A longer time than four. It will take a very long time. It's not quite linear, yes. And But what's the good thing about it? You, you're taking um, everyone's perspective into the process. Yeah, it takes everyone's perspective or give everybody an opportunity to say something. What about you, Sheila? Anything good or bad about this arrangement? If you were to do a round with all these people? It's a little time consuming with that many people. It's time consuming, 100%. And, but what's the goodness about it? Well, everybody's heard. Everyone's heard. So And a lot of Sorry. times that just means that they'll be, they will buy into it because they feel that they were part of the decision-making process. Yes. And there's also a dangerous thing because then some people maybe not so outwardly, extrovertly, you know, some people may need time to process things. And it's, it's not set up for everybody to succeed, but generally speaking, you know, that's, that's a way to do it. It will be time consuming. And sometimes we're running out of, a lot of times, Time pressures are very real. Well, do so, you have to do it as a single session or can you do it where you have one session where you lay everything out, give people a day or two to absorb it and then have a second session where you, you can totally, you can totally send pre yeah. like prepared materials to study. You can say, hey, there's, here's the report, here's the data that Salah requested, here's the layout, here are the options, here's the furniture list, here's the suppliers, here's this current quantities, the cost, so we could send pre, there's, it's totally okay to send that stuff in front. So we don't waste time doing that during the meeting. Yes, but still just the size of it is a question. So then, then so I'm gonna just quickly go ahead because I, I'm just looking at the time too. So we may run out of time, so I may not be able to do justice if I ramp it down. But this is a common thing in agile structures. We form teams, we form teams, and then we do reduce that. But then what happens, what happens? silos get created, even in agile teams, because we didn't think about the interconnecting layers, right? That's where we say, well, we're kind of not aligned anymore, right? You hear that complaint, right? So maybe Salah and Sheila are in this circle, right? Salah and Sheila are in this circle, and uh, Naga is in this circle, and I'm here in this circle, and then we come together and we were like arguing, like, I, I mean, I have to catch you up now, right? Because you didn't get to hear the information that we have. So, but that's a common problem. So this solves the delay problem, but it solves that now not everybody's on the same page. It's not quite aligned. The other way we're probably familiar with is somebody is a big boss here. So say Sheila is right here on top. She's our big boss. And then she has her vice presidents and they have their directors and then they have their managers and they have their supervisors. And down here somewhere is me and Naga and uh, you know uh, Salah. Now it's alignment because we are aligned to our next level layer, but then it's really, you know, it's, it's, it's the typical command and control and delays happen. And you know, the telephone game happens. The telephone game happens where information is misinterpreted from the VP to the director, to the manager, to the supervisor and things happen. So that's another structure. Now with sociocracy, we say, you know what? None of this is good or bad. They have pros and cons and we're not saying, remove hierarchy altogether, 
we're saying embrace a new type of hierarchy. And we call that hierarchy circles. So what we do is now Sheila being a, our big boss still or the leader, we create a new circle around that. And so the hierarchy, so the Sheila is actually a member. She comes to those meetings and she's arranging with these people. And then we form other circles. So over time, what's happening is there is a general circle, which all the leaders of other circles, so we're using some abbreviation here and I'm jumping, I'm jumping fast a little bit, but essentially we created the same structure of that same number of people, but we have a core group, the general circle or the executive body, or maybe in some terms, you'll say guiding coalition or executive action team. There's many, or steering committee, but it is selected positions, right? So there's a little bit of a variation. And L means a leader, D means a delegate. And that's, an in, that's, the, that's the model that sociocracy runs their own company that way and also embraces with how to make sociocracy work. So in this case, if you look at circle A, there's a leader and delegate of that circle who also attends the general circle, right? Does it make sense? And the leader and delegated are a selected position. So meaning that leader is really responsible for holding the aim of what, people, what, what the, why do we even exist the infrastructure maintenance circle? And the delegate is a second voice that's added, that's the selected position. And they hold equal power in the general circle. Mission circle is a little bit special because that's like the board of directors is as commonly known, but you know, people who are, who are more focused on why, what is the whole holistic vision of this group? And by having this structure, now what happens is when they meet and they meet, those concerns and objections are brought in at that level. So there's an opportunity to bring in. And then the aims and the domains are what create the mandate. So domains, so circle B maybe, so this is the infrastructure and maintenance, this is the recruitment and retention, for example, and this is the holistic cooking and material supply circle, for example. But then when they get together, they're getting to hear about what's going on and the circle reports and then making decisions. In a way, I mean, I, I have drawn parallels myself in my practice between this and Scrum of Scrums. And I've drawn those parallels and I think it, it matches very, very well. So that's the general idea. But what we do here, the objective here is to have unseeded flow of information. So the double linkage is critical. The double linkage is critical. So those two icons, the leader and delegate, leader and delegate, who are part of two groups and they expand is because information is flowing back and forth without any restrictions that only some people hold that power and other people don't. And because of that flow, we, we embrace the circle structure so that information is never getting blocked or somebody holds that against others. So what this is really is a decentralized decision-making protocol, right? So if this circle made a decision about chairs, when the leader and delegate says, Sheila may be our leader and say, Naga is the delegate, they're going into the main circle and they're saying, well, what our decision was. And then they may might hear an objection. A great example that uh, Ted, who, who's the co-founder of Sociocracy for All, he shares is, imagine you have, uh, a circle, and this is a gardening example, a circle is responsible for gardening in a housing in intentional community, and another circle who's doing fencing for that community. They may decide that, hey, we need to put a new fence there, but without, and they may have concern that, hey, if they put fence in an area of plants that need full sun, that's gonna create shade, where is that gonna be raised? Unless there's a way to coordinate that information. They say, oh, so you guys decided on fencing, but here's the objection that we have in the general circle that by putting fences over there, you're gonna, all the new plants that we planted that require full sun are gonna get shade and they're gonna die. But without that, they may be independently making decisions and we create this coordinating layer and, and the companies grow and evolve and intake. So that's, it is a very, very fluid way of running organizations and decisions are made at the edge and then objections kind of self-sustains, and then we navigate through the objections to make things, make better decisions at the edge that's responsible for it. And we also want to point out that feedback is very critical, but feedback is not decision-making. Say, oh, you know, I'm just giving you feedback. This is no good. 
but what was the decision? So objection could be a form of feedback, but what was the decision? So we still need to make decisions to keep on moving forward in a way that we're balancing everybody's voice, egalitarian and effect, effect, efficiency, that we're not taking too much time. So in sociocracy, we have these special roles and uh, we can talk about how they are very, they kind of match um, say Scrum and other places too, but essentially a leader who is a selected position makes sure that the circle is making progress towards the aim. A delegate is a second voice towards the parent circle and a secretary is the person who's responsible for taking notes. So for example, in, in our mock exercise, I play the role of the facilitator and the secretary. And Salah, this is going back to your question, right? Like there has to be. So we say at minimum, you need these four roles. But then there's also operational roles, somebody who makes the website, so you know, and those could be defined. And there's a little bit more advanced topic, but we totally have guidance on that too. Sheila, I saw you uh, get, go on mute. Was there a question? Yeah. All right, awesome. So we didn't have time, so I said time permitting, but we're running out of time. So what I've talked about selection process is similar to that protocol. We define the role and the term, we gather qualifications, we consent to the qualifications, we note down the nominations, and we do a change route. What it looks like, something like this. Facilitator, facil so this is a role for a facilitator for our small infrastructure circle, as an example. We fac facilitate small meetings, and the term is just today, but might be extended. Or well, what are the type of things we need to go and facilitate? So we'll go in rounds, gathering that information. What does a good facilitator do? And clarify, clarify, clarify. Then we put our names down here. And I'm gonna to just to give an example. So for example, I'll say Sheila, Salah. And if we had more time, we'd probably have done, but it, uh, Naga and myself. And we would have gone through a nomination round and then we've gone through a change round. So because it requires a little bit of time and effort, I'm not gonna go through it right now, but I'll give you an example of how it played out in another scenario. Whereas these are the people, so first we said, but well, what are the quality? Every went in, went in rounds and added more texture. What well, this person needs to be hold space. Salah may have said like, oh, they need to be themselves. You know, Sheila may say, let's have a good sense of time ability to speak fairly, et cetera, et cetera, Naga would have contributed. So we would have all created these qualifications for that particular role. And then we have, would have gone in rounds and nominated who we think should be the facilitator for our circle. And it's not an outsider, third party, which is what we typically learn in coaching, right? Say, this is to be unattached. In sociocracy, no, it's within. It's amongst you who has to be the facilitator. So we'll say that, and now notice everybody saying a certain name. Then we'll ask the question, Anita, you say, Tamsin, would you consent to Mary becoming a facilitator? And she said, yeah, I can go either way. But now Mary kind of gave a different object, a different person, and then she gave a different person. She didn't want to nominate herself, but she can totally nominate herself. And in this particular case, we ask her, is there an objection? Is there a harm? And he says, well, not really harm. I just don't want to do it, but I'm good at it and I'm capable of it. If I were asked, I have no objection to that. And then we say, well, if all the objections is out, do we all consent to it? And then you could reduce the term and that's how we create you know, process. So for example, in the free and open source circle, I am, the, I am currently the secretary for that circle, right? And you know, I did a change around where I said, oh, I really want somebody else to do it, but I really didn't have a real objection other than my preference. So I hope that illustrates one of the aspects of like, you know, how we also appoint people, not appoint, but select people, right? In a holistic, more efficient way. So with that, I, there's other ways I've implemented in an agile, um, just as an example, you know, we, uh, I had a group that is, was vendor management, uh, uh, center of excellence. And they were had some feelings about, hey, Scrum doesn't work for us, Kanban doesn't work for us. And I said, okay, well, let's work with what can work for us. So I went through like gathering all the information of, well, what are the considerations? We should think about this. Then what are the proposals? And then talk about objections. We went through objections. We integrated those objections and we all consented to it. And people feel like their voice is like, all right, so we are kind of compared to Scrum and Kanban, there was another process, but this is, 
the way we also make proposals instead of saying like very religious about it, because there may be genuine reasons why a certain form of say Scrum or Kanban may not work for them, but then work with what can work realistically right now until we get to a place where we need to integrate objections and move forward. It's just a more humane and efficient way of continuing to move towards the goal. So there's more items that we can talk about, about democracy, whole group consensus, the pros and cons. But at the end of the day, it's about consent, like I mentioned. It's about meetings and how we do run those meetings in a way that's useful. How do we structure, create circles and roles? And how do we evaluate performance in a way that is not mean, but is holding a space that is useful for all of us? And surfacing issues, learning to trust each other, listening to each other, you know, in some cases acknowledging them and redirecting it if that's not useful for them. And then creating clear agendas, clear purpose, what Sheila originally asked. We have to be, we have to have clear agenda. You cannot catch people by surprise where they haven't even time to process things. That's not nice. So we we want to make sure that it is nice also, but we're getting things done. We are making decisions. We're going and buying those chairs and tables because that was the decision of the group, right? We move forward. So if you guys are interested, I wanna make a pitch for like, you know, go to sociocracyforall.org slash training. There is a lot more. I just touched the surface of it. And I can see from a business agility aspect of it, it is so valuable. And you can drive a whole organization if they're ready for it into, into a next level unlocking of their potential. There are three books, Many Voices, One Song, Who Decides, Who Decide, and then the school book called Risk Decide Together. So with that, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna open up the space for any questions that you might have. I know I just kind of ran through the content at the end of it, but what questions do you have now? Yeah, I, I yeah, thank you, Ahmed. So this is very insightful. Um, yeah, the distinction between consent and consensus is very, is very clear, like taking into account objections and you know making sure that everyone is heard, um, you know, is 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 very, um, you know, it could take a lot of time. I, I guess I mean as you showed, like different structures and configurations, but at the end of the day, you know, maybe people are more likely to buy into the decisions. Yeah, they, they share the objections. I, I will tell if I may share my experience. So the first two, three months when I was in the free and open source circles, it was just taking forever. Our meetings would be so long, but we've gotten into a rhythm of it. We are so efficient with our backlogs, the information, we get stuff done this quickly because now we build up the rhythm. But yeah, it was so awkward. The first few months was like, oh, why is it taking so long? because we didn't quite know each other as much. There were so other dynamics, but yes, it's an experience that is very common with other circles I talk to too. Yeah. Yeah, it takes into account, like you said, I mean, the, there's other models, like uh, in, especially in the leadership domains and coaching, like that the, the try to balance, um, you know, the balance uh, relationships and, and tasks or progress, right? So, so if we're, we're, we're focused too much on the progress, you know, relationships might suffer or people might not feel like they're heard. And if we're focused too much on relationships, then the tasks may, may not get done or things may not get done, as, as you mentioned. Uh, my question, I guess it's more around like, so so as you pointed out, this there is some overlap. I mean, not over, but elements that align with Scrum at scale or Scrum uh, of Scrums. And I mean, even open space, there is some elements of open space in there too. Um, what have it, it, it was is there like when you say shared decision or shared power is that something that's explicitly stated um or is that something that the group you know tried to come up with together with the with the leader so if if there are some people who are holding power over others it's kind of like sociocracy breaks down but there are typically like you know when some some organization starts the founders, for example, in the organization that are practicing sociocracy, and there are more and more companies that are listed on the, so if you go to sociocracy for all and you click on who's using it, who's running the whole organization, there's a growing number of intentional community, perma permaculture, 
uh, even some software companies that are now governing themselves that way. But, but at the end of the day, when, when somebody creates a new company, a software company, for example, there's a company called Gather that makes meal sharing software for, for it's a software company, but they run sociocracy themselves, right? So when they're doing it, they there were people who started that company and they kind of took on the role of a leader, right? But over time, they're also giving other people opportunity to become the leader where then, then they take a back seat, right? And that's that's a growth opportunity. In some cases, the leader's term keeps on continuing because it still makes sense for them to be the leader because they understand the aim most than anybody else. But at the end of the day, we're not suppressing people's voice and we're not suppressing objections and we're working with it so that it's still useful. So there's an important, there is a power difference, but it's not, the, the, the power difference is for the, for the function of, are we moving towards the aim or are we not moving towards the aim? It's not just about feeling good. It's about getting work done too. Oh, you're on mute, Salah. Uh, yeah, it's like it's, it's sort of like balancing autonomy with alignment, as you mentioned. Yes. If every like we break it down to smaller circles, and then everyone is has the autonomy, but at the same time we're not aligned, we're going in different directions. So, um, so yeah, that that makes that makes sense. Yeah, uh, if everybody's going in many different directions, we may have the wrong picture, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. What other questions you guys have? Is there any way this can work if you don't have the entire company doing it? Like if it's just within a division? So yes. So you can introduce the idea of rounds. There's some amazing agenda templates that you can use for sociocracy, which is how I used to run my meetings with a team of coaches. So you can take elements of it, but you know, for a very large organization, it's going to be probably a very uphill battle to try to say governance structures are changing. For a small company of 25 people, 30 people, it's usually uh, we're finding more and more organizations that size that have adopted this, whether it's holacracy or sociocracy, they've adopted this and it's easier for them. Larger is much more difficult, but you also don't have to do the wholesale. Eh? It's all or nothing. We say, well, how do we talk about going through rounds, for example, introducing rounds is something I had no difficulty introducing with my scrum teams or even with product managers, COEs, agile coaches. I had no difficulty doing that because it's just a protocol of how to facilitate. But then there's other elements of selection instead of volunteering, creating structures, you may have, as you go more and more, there may be some advanced topics, but you can totally bring in elements of sociocracy in wherever you are. And I, I don't know if you're familiar with the Agile fluency model. Are you familiar with the Agile fluency model? So there's an advanced zone where sociocracy makes sense, right? But it doesn't usually make sense in very, very large corporations that have structures from, from the 60s and maybe even earlier that they're holding on to that. So that will be hard, but for newer companies, uh, I mean, we're talking to an open source software company that is working with Linux and they're they're interested in, running their whole organization in sociocracy. So there are more and more people who are raising their hands. Corporate rebels is another group. You know, Renden Haye is another group. So there's, it's, it's slowly, it's, but it is a paradigm shift. It takes a while, right? But it is more inclusive. People who are part of these organizations are fiercely loyal, fiercely loyal. And then because they feel like they belong, they found their, they found their calling, they found their people. and. What are the common complaints you're getting? People are quiet quitting, right? That's what you hear right now. It's like silly problems that could be solved because the workplaces are becoming toxic for people. Right. So I'm just looking at time. I think probably should write. Naga, did you have any questions for me? No, I'm good. I'm just uh, learning on it. Yeah. Thank you. And and by the way, on a large scale experiment, there is, maybe I should share this with you. Naga, you may, might be interested. So if you look up this documentary called the Children's Parliament, there are 10,000 kids in the south of Southern India that have created a parliament with children and that's applying sociocracy at a, 
insane scale. It's a very beautiful documentary. The uh, I think it's called the Children's Parliament or something, but it is it, it is another form of sociocracy that's practiced at scale. All right. Let me just run through that. Yeah, absolutely. I think I may be able to even find uh, the link if I if I have my hands ready. Here we go. I did find it. So I'm I'm old but not that old. So I think I got it. <laughs> Here here's here's a wonderful just to see like how the world is shifting and these kids. I mean, I can see in their eyes, these kids are, their future leaders who are, yeah, I just imagine this. running funding for a whole community, a city, villages, children running it, right? And Maybe. it is it is by no scale, no small feat. Yep, I just got it, uh, yeah. yeah. And that's not the original documentary, by the way, but it, it, it is, it will take you in the right spot. <laughs> yep. nice. Anyway, awesome. so I, I thought I'd share that to you guys. Cool. Thank you. Well, I think I'm I'm complete here, Salah. Yeah. Thank you. Take it away. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much for this insightful um, conversation and, and presentation. So um Really appreciate your your insights, um, and uh, yeah, I've got, uh, I have some some many takeaways. I'm I'm hoping others have, have uh, taken uh, some insights as well. So uh, thank you again, and uh, thank you, Naga and and Sheila for joining. Thanks, Ahmed, for your time, and uh, we'll uh, we'll see you again next uh, next time. Thank you so much. All right, have a good evening. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye.